Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson for January 20th, 2019. That is Lesson 8. Uh, we are still in Unit 2 uh, for this quarter, which is entitled Loving God by Trusting Christ. Loving God by Trusting Christ. From the Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly Commentary, our lesson title is Good from Bad good from bad and our devotional reading is first peter chapter 4 verses 12 to 19 our background scripture philippians 1 verses 12 to 21 which is also our printed passage and lesson aims from the quarterly or number one explore paul's historical circumstances in this letter and his responses to them number two forgive those who have sought to benefit from our misfortune and then number three look for opportunities to share in God's work in the world through Jesus Christ the adult quarterly lesson has three major divisions after the introduction the first is advancing the gospel. That's covered between Philippians 1, verses 12 to 14. The second is motives don't matter. And that's covered between chapter 1, verses 15 and 18b. And then the third is the reason for rejoicing. The reason for rejoicing, and that's covered between chapter 1, verses 18c and 21 from the standard commentary the lesson title is rejoice in all circumstances rejoice in all circumstances and additional aims are number one recall the difficult circumstances in which Paul expressed his joy in Christ to the Philippian church number two explain how the gospel produces persistent joy in difficult circumstances and that may be difficult for us to to fully grasp hopefully we'll have a better grasp on that after we go through the lesson today and then number three create a plan for expressing persistent joy in Christ through one's present circumstances whatever they are I'll add the uh, standard uh, outline has three divisions. The first is Gospel Advanced, uh, Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 to 14. The second is Christ Preached, uh, chapter 1, verses 15 to 18a, and then Results Considered, and that's uh, co covered between chapter 1, verses 18b and 21. Now what I'd like to do is to read through our lesson text uh, and then we will get into our, we'll give a little background uh, and then we'll get into our lesson text. I mean, we'll get into our verse by verse uh, lesson discussion. So beginning at verse 12, and actually maybe we'll give a little background before we uh, get into our lesson text. The epistle or letter to the Philippian church was written during Paul's first imprisonment in Rome. He was imprisoned in Rome for approximately two years between 60 and 62 A.D. And it was written uh, sometime during that, Im that first imprisonment. He was uh, uh, re-imprisoned around 67 A.D. and, and uh, as a result... The second time, tradition has it that he uh, he was executed. Uh, but uh, now, uh, Philippi was a 
a, church, uh, a, a city, if you will, that was named for Philip of Macedon, who was the father of Alexander the Great. And it was actually established in about 358 B.C., uh, later became uh, a, a part of the Roman Empire, uh, and, and was on a major uh, Roman road via Ignatia, which connected the east and the west coast of the Grecian Peninsula. Uh, Paul established a church there um, in uh, during his second missionary journey. Uh, he was uh, told by the Spirit to go over into uh, Macedonia in Acts chapter 16, and actually uh, and that, that was Western Europe, or Europe if you will, and, and that was the first church established in the West. And you may remember um, in that uh, 16th chapter of Acts where Paul and Silas uh, were uh, imprisoned in, in, in Philippi. And you remember uh, they were singing praises uh, during the night and the prison was shaken and the, the doors were open and their bands fell and you, you remember that when, uh, uh, as a result, uh, he ended up leading the, uh, the prison keeper uh, and his family to the Lord. And in the years following, um, Paul established a very close relationship with the Philippians, and they, uh, they certainly loved him. And, uh, and as a matter of fact, they sent one of their leaders, Epaphroditus, to visit Paul at Rome and to carry uh, a gift to him. They had also sent uh, gifts to, to support Paul uh, previously. Uh, and Epaphroditus became very ill, as you may recall reading, uh, and uh, but recovered. And uh, after visiting Paul, um, uh, Paul returned this letter to the Philippian church by Epaphroditus. Now the um, the main thought of Philippians uh, is the all sufficiency of Christ in any circumstance, good or bad. Uh, it also uh, speaks of the joy that we can have in any circumstance. In fact, it has been called uh, the Epistle of Joy uh, and or the, the book of joy. And Paul made um, reference to joy or rejoice or joyous uh, some 18 times in this, in this epistle. So uh, again, uh, Paul has uh, written by Epaphroditus. Uh, he gives uh, a salutation in the first chapter. Uh, this letter is from him and Timothy, servants of Christ. And he talks about uh, uh, being very confident that in verse 6 of chapter 1, that he which had begun a good work in you, that is them, will perform it until the day of Christ. And he goes on uh, to explain his circumstance. And in verse 12, then he begins to uh, further explain his circumstance and his interpretation of his own circumstance. And he wants to, to make them understand what God is doing through his circumstance. And as we read this, uh, we want to, to realize that God works through our circumstances as well, good or bad, to accomplish his will. And he wants us to trust him and not only trust him, but to count it all joy, as James tells us in the first chapter of his epistle, when we fall into diverse or different trials, knowing this that the trying of our faith worketh patience. And we're to let patience have its perfect work, that we may be perfect and in entire or complete, mature. All right, um, so we're going to go ahead and read our lesson text, uh, which begins at verse 12 of chapter 1, and it reads, But I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather for the furtherance of the gospel, uh, 
so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of good will. The one preach Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayers and through the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be in by life or by death. In verse 21, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And our key verse was verse 12, which again reads, I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather for the furtherance of the gospel. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Father, we do thank you and we praise you again for this day, Lord, and always for your loving kindness, your tender mercy. And Lord, as we undertake to study your word, Lord, we pray that you would give us a clearer understanding of your word, Lord. And Lord, as, our, as we understand your word, increase our faith in you, Lord. And as our faith is increased, Increase our obedience, Lord. Help us to apply what we learn of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's just jump right in at verse 12, um, which reads again, But I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather for the furtherance of the gospel. Let's read that in the NIV, which reads, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. Well, what, first of all, why do you think it's necessary for Paul to explain this? Uh, I think all of us realize that being in prison um, is bad news, and it has a stigma uh, the no doubt some of uh, the Philippians are wondering uh, if what Paul has been preaching is true, if God is with Paul, uh, you know, maybe Paul has done, uh, has done, committed some sin that has landed him uh, in prison as a, a perhaps punishment or judgment of God. There are all kinds of things that might be going through the minds of the Philippians. Uh, and, of course, uh, you would think that his being in prison actually stifled his ministry of the gospel. And Paul is going to explain how that hasn't been the case. In fact, uh, his imprisonment has actually furthered his proclamation of the gospel. And, God, and, and Paul is interpreting... Uh, the, the meaning of his own uh, situation there or circumstance. And I'm sure with the guidance of the Holy Spirit, uh, he's given him an understanding of why he's uh, not only suffering here, but why Paul suffered throughout his, his ministry. You read Second, Second Corinthians uh, and you'll read about his, his suffering uh, for the advancement of the gospel in his ministry to the churches. Uh, so he needs to put things in context. God knows what he's doing. Uh, he's not uh, put on a shelf and, 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 and ineffective. Uh, he's actually having some effect in the prison, and he's going to explain, or while he's in prison, he's going to explain in the next few verses uh, how he's uh, having that effect. So verse 13 so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace 
and in all other places. And very uh, quickly from the NIV, uh, same verse, as a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and so everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Now, Paul is, uh, if you recall from Acts chapter 28, he was left in his own house in prison. He's not in the traditional uh, dungeon type prison, but he's given his own house. He's allowed to have visitors. However, there are guards there uh, uh, guarding him night and day. And they are apparently part of the imperial guard or the Praetorian Guard, which is an elite military unit entrusted, entrusted with the safety of the emperor and other high officials. And, and as they are guarding him, uh, Paul has opportunity to share the gospel with him and is doing that. And also, they, they have been made to understand that he is actually in prison for the proclamation of the gospel of his faith. Uh, and so that's what he's explaining here. He's having, or the Lord is using him, even in his bonds or in his chains, uh, to reach those he has contact with. Now, what, is, what does that say about us? I mean, do, do you have to be in chains to, to share the gospel with those uh, in your uh, sphere of influence? No. I mean, we should be sharing the gospel, sharing our faith with those we, we have in, we, we, that are in our fear seer rather of influence those we have contact with uh, I mean there's an appropriate way you can do that uh, at your job there's an appropriate way you can do that in, in almost every circumstance so uh, let's keep that in mind uh, they don't have to see you uh, suffering uh, but certainly when you're suffering and you're doing that in faith and you're still praising the Lord that we serve that's a tremendous testimony let's move on to verse 14. And because of my chains, let me, that's the NIV version. Let's go back to the King James first. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. From the NIV. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Now, how, how is this uh, happening? How is this a result of Paul's imprisonment? Well, I, I think that many who uh, are believers and proclaimers of the gospel or uh, encouraged or inspired, if you will, by Paul's uh, sacrifice, by Paul's uh, willingness uh, to be in prison uh, because of his faith, because of his proclaiming the gospel. And it emboldens them. It actually uh, inc it gives them the courage to do the same, or it inspires them. Uh, to do the same uh, with, without fear. Uh, they, they, they understand fully what the consequence might be, the same as Paul's. And, and, and let's understand, Paul doesn't know at this point whether he is going to uh, be sentenced to death after he appears before the emperor. He's appealed to the emperor, and of course uh, the, the sentence could go either way. He could be released, as he, he was, uh, only later to be re-imprisoned and executed, or he could be executed uh, uh, following his uh, trial, if you will, before the emperor. So the others that were emboldened by his imprisonment, his willingness to be imprisoned for the sake of the gospel, uh, understand that they run the same risk. Verse 15, Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of good will. From the NIV, uh, the same verse, it is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of good will. Now, um, Paul was well known, a well known apostle of Jesus Christ. Uh, 
no doubt some of the miracles that uh, God performed or the Lord performed through Paul were known. Uh, and so he had a certain stature, uh, and he was called the apostle to the Gentiles. That uh, no doubt there were some preachers, uh, perhaps charlatans, were envious of. And now with Paul parked in prison, uh, they figured, well, hey, they can perhaps take Paul's place or get some of the uh, attention that Paul was getting. Uh, they're envious of his stature, and, and their motives are impure the motives are wrong for advancing the gospel in other words i mean they have really selfish desires uh that is uh, driving them to preach the gospel and it's ironic that uh they are preaching a selfless christ with selfish motives i mean that's <laughs> That's very ironic. So the reasons for preaching are, are selfish, but they're preaching a selfless Christ. And Paul's going to say more about this in just a minute. And then he says uh, in verse 16, uh, The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bond. That's from the King James Version. And the, the NIV is... is uh, Stated a little differently, 16 in the NIV, the latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. Now, um, the the contention that he's talking about, some preaching out of contention. As I said, you know, there 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 is some contentiousness between. Uh, these preachers and Paul, they're envious, they're desirous of his stature, uh, and they're not sincere in what they are preaching. That they, they, they cannot fully understand uh, the, the meaning of what they're preaching. Uh, uh, if they're preaching Christ with sincerity, then they know, then they, they, they have to know uh, how impactful that should be uh, on on their own lives first of all and then the lives of others I remember uh, years ago my brother who was a deacon and saved uh, years before I was um, uh, me basically when I came to know the Lord and, par and partly because the Lord used him to lead me uh, to faith and I grew up in the church as many of you did but I didn't come to know the Lord until I was 32 years old when I got into his word but I remember making a statement that, uh, you know, uh, the Lord doesn't use anybody that uh, that does not truly uh, know him or something along that line. And, and my brother took me directly to this passage in First Philippians and said, no, that's not true. That's not true. And he, and he basically said, hey, some preach Christ of contention and strife. And then we're going to see how in a minute Paul says whether it's it's because of love or motivated by love or contention and strife, Christ is preached. All right. Now, this, as for this adding to his affliction and his bonds, I mean, he, these uh, that are uh, envious, these that uh, uh, want uh, uh, to uh, re replace him or they would like his position or stature, uh, they are... I mean, they, they, they don't care if Paul stays in prison. Matter of fact, the longer he's there, uh, the better uh, they'll be in terms of their stature uh, in the church. And even if that means his death, uh, they, you know, they don't have a, apparently have a problem with that. So when he says adding to his bonds, to, hey, the longer you stay in there, uh, the more we can bask in, uh, in, the, in, the, in, in the sunlight here. Verse 17, but others of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. So some are preaching with contention and strife and envy, but others are motivated by love, knowing that Christ is a bold example of one who is uh, going to, is determined to defend the gospel, uh, and when it says um, this, this, this love is a reflection of the love of God. Uh, this, this agape uh, 
love of God. Uh, and that is the, 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 the true motive or that should, that is what should motivate any of us to preach the gospel motivated by the same love that God had for us or has for us, that love that sent his son here to die on a cross for us. And so they're motivated by love, and they know that Paul is steadfast in his defense of the gospel, even if it means his death. And they're, they're inspired by that again. They're motivated by that, as, as we should be. You know, one of the things that uh, I neglect I haven't done more of is, is reading biographies of, uh, of Christian uh, leaders, past Christian leaders. I think that, that does us a world of good in inspiring us to be bold leaders. Bonhoeffer and others uh, inspires us to be bolder uh, in our faith and proclamation of the gospel. Verse 18a, what then? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. From the NIV, that verse reads, But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Now, that was uh, part A and B. But uh, again... Um, God knows the motives of all who proclaim his word. And, and it's sad to say there are many that are proclaiming his word that don't know him. Uh, you read Matthew chapter 7, I think it's verse 21 to 23, when uh, many are going to come to the Lord in the last day and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this? No, he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. And they're going to say, Lord, didn't we do this and didn't we... Didn't we uh, do that in your name? And then he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. Uh, we, we uh, unfortunately, uh, have too many uh, that are in pulpits and that are proclaiming the gospel on radio and TV, perhaps, that don't truly know the Lord and that are doing it for uh, impure motives, uh, for money, for filthy lucre, for stature, for fame. Uh, for other reasons than love, the love of God. And, of course, God is going to deal with them accordingly. But the, the others that he's talking about have pure motives, again, of love. And he says, but w w whichever way, whatever the motives are, if Christ is preached, then uh, he rejoices because the gospel is going out Again, regardless of the motives, uh, there was there was a saying. Uh, one of the commentators said that, uh, unfortunately, there are going to be uh, many preachers in hell uh, having preached a gospel that uh, resulted in many being saved and going to heaven. And unfortunately, uh, I think that is a reality. Now, uh, when he says he rejoices, again, Paul is again explaining, putting this passage in context, how his imprisonment is furthering the gospel. First, is furthering the gospel by his ministering to the, the guards around him and those that they influence, those that are, that are in their fears of influence in, in all the palace, if you will, the, the emperor's palace. Uh, and then, secondly, through those who are inspired uh, whose faith uh, and boldness is inspired by Paul's imprisonment. And they are preaching with pure motives, but even those who are envious and preaching with impure motives, the gospel is being preached. So the furtherance of the gospel is happening, as Paul said in verse 12. Verse 19, For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayers and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. From the NIV, uh, that same verse, verse 19, reads, For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. 
Now, first of all, there, there, there are two things that Paul knows that their prayers are going to be effectual. And him hearing and knowing that they're praying for him is going to certainly be a great encouragement. But also the supply of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of Christ is going to produce or result in his deliverance. Now, this word uh, deliverance or salvation, it says in the uh, in the King James, it does say deliverance in the NIV. Uh, this term uh, is not necessarily uh, the same as we use when we think about spiritual salvation. This is a, a military or economic term. It's it's a term that you might use uh, uh, in trying to explain how an army delivered a a city from uh, from uh, captivity or delivered uh, some troops that were uh, that were stranded or pent down in a in a battlefield situation or how um, uh, uh, economic uh, changes were made by city government that actually provided some relief for the citizenry so it is that kind of deliverance and, and in the context of Paul being in prison he's basically confident that he's going to be found not guilty it can also be applied in a uh, uh, in a in a a judging situation where a an accused is found not guilty and as it turns out he was uh released he was found not guilty and he was released uh to serve a few more years uh before again being uh reincarcerated or reimprisoned in around uh AD 67 and I misspoke a little bit earlier he was actually in prison between 60 and 63 AD before and sometime during that period he wrote this epistle to the Philippians and one of the commentators said says something about the saved life here and again uh, in this context we don't believe we're talking about the salvation that that delivers uh, from uh, eternal punishment or eternal separation from God uh, that that salvation uh, spiritual salvation which ultimately is the deliverance from the penalty of sin uh, that's when we're justified from the power of sin that's as we're being sanctified and ultimately from the very presence of sin and that's when we are glorified and, and go to live in the presence of the, the Lord uh, but the commentator says the saved life is the God supplied God empowered God honoring life so in, a, in another way Paul is delivered to to continue um, living uh, a spirit supply God supplied spirit empowered and God honoring life as we all have been uh, now verse 20 a reads according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed from the NIV it reads I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed so what so what is he talking about there you know I I often um, make mention of the fact that the word hope uh, as it's used in in most places in the New Testament or in the Bible period does not mean uh, the wishy uh, kind of thing that uh, that that we typically mean when we use it today but it means a confident expectation well here he says he expects and he hopes and really the uh, the the hope really expresses his sincere expectation it's basically an embellishment of the of the word expectation uh, that he is not going to be ashamed well you might ask ashamed of what well as, as I said earlier you know arrest is shameful I mean for most of us even today imprisonment is shameful trial is shameful uh, execution of course uh, even if it's, for, if, it's for, if it's for something that we did not do is shameful you know Jesus um, 
was hung on a cross naked. I know uh, in most uh, on most crucifixes you see the little uh, loincloth, a little ro a robe uh, hanging around him for modesty, but he was hung on a cross naked uh, and and bore our sins on that cross. That was shameful, you know. Uh, uh, him who uh, created uh, pain, endured pain and suffering for us. It was shameful. But what Paul is saying is that he, he cannot be made ashamed, uh, even though he's in uh, in that circumstance. He's in prison. Uh, he's about to go to trial. Uh, he, he has an indomitable confidence. That's another way of expressing this hope, uh, that uh, he is not going to be ashamed. Uh, in fact, uh, he, is, he is going to maintain his honor and uh, he's been transformed by the message of Jesus Christ and is willing to accept uh, anything that we might perceive as, as shameful, arrest, trial, uh, even execution, uh, without shame. Just as, as Christ was, was vindicated uh, by his resurrection, I mean, Paul realizes ultimately he's going to be vindicated by Christ, regardless of what happens. Uh, he's going to be found to be right and to be just. And, and, and to be honorable and to, and to have that honor uh, uh, that, that, that identifies him with Christ. And we need to understand that as we follow Christ, and that we have to really be following Christ, there is nothing for us to be ashamed of. I mean, Peter tells us in First Peter, you know, hey, if, you, if you've done something uh, deserving of punishment, uh, then, you know, hey, uh, that's on you. You know, you, you uh, uh, own up to that and, and you deserve what you're getting. But, but when we're punished for having done nothing but follow Christ, uh, that's when we uh, are commended by the Lord. And that's what we, we need to keep in mind always. Part B uh, says, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. And uh, from the NIV, uh, the second part, part B of verse 20 reads, But that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or or by death. All boldness. Paul has been bold. Paul has boldly proclaimed his faith throughout his ministry from the time he was lowered uh, from the wall of the city in, in, in Damascus in a basket. Paul has boldly proclaimed Christ and very often at the risk of his life and certainly his health. And, and Paul reflects the same uh, boldness that that Jesus uh, Christ did. And he reflects uh, Jesus' own determination. And Paul actually confesses uh, this uh, uh, faithfulness and, and, and likeness to Christ's uh, own confession in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6, verse 11 to 16. Let's just take a minute and read that very quickly. And it reads, But thou, O man, of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto art also thou art also called and hast proclaimed a good profession before many witnesses. I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable unto the appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his time he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. The Lord Jesus witnessed a good uh, confession uh, before Pilate, and, and we should be inspired by that as Paul has been inspired. And Paul, of course, uh, 
when he actually goes before uh, Caesar, I have no doubt, or the, the emperor, I have no doubt, will witness his confession, a good confession. Uh, and then, and he says, he says, whether it be by life, in other words, he's saying with boldness, he's going to be magnified. Let's back up and see uh, what that word magnified means. Well, the simple definition of magnified is to make something greater or to make something appear greater. And actually, uh, I believe to make something greater and so that's what he, he's talking about. And he says, um, whether in life or in death, if he lives, he's going to continue to to proclaim Christ, his greatness. And he uh, is going to continue to do that fervently and to make the gospel uh, magnified or greater uh, in uh, in his proclamation. And and of course, in the world. Uh, and then he says, or by death. So, uh, and, and this basically means if if uh, Christ, if he if he's executed for uh, his proclamation or his faith in the Lord Jesus, then he's going to be glorified and magnified. Uh, the Lord is going to be glorified and magnified by that as well. And, and really, this this again, magnification means to make the 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 name of Jesus great. And we're not talking about Paul making himself. Great. Paul doesn't have selfish motives here. We're talking about magnifying the Lord Jesus here. So, uh, basically, in summary, what Paul is saying in this verse is that he is going to continue to magnify the name of Christ or glorify the name of Christ, whether he lives or throughout the remainder of his life, uh, he's going to continue that ministry or by death that reflects, again, Christ's own uh a selfless uh, giving of himself or his life. And then finally, verse 21, he kind of summarizes uh, the last uh, couple of verses here. Uh, he says, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Uh, and that is a, a very brief verse that is one of the best known and best loved uh, and, and, and widely memorized verses in the Bible. Uh, our commentator says here, and uh, we think about death as gain. You know, we kind of wrestle with that. Um, we we um, see death as the ultimate failure. You know, uh, uh, failure of our bodies. You know, the end of our activities, our earthly uh, consciousness, uh, uh, and and. Uh, so it can be looked at as a very negative thing, the, the utter or utmost loss. But Paul uh, sees it, okay, through the eyes of one who has been transformed by faith in, in Christ. And, of course, uh, he's, he's, he's looking uh, from an eternal perspective. Um, you know, he's looking at... Uh, Edit from the the eyes of one again who has been transformed by the gospel, and we don't view life and death as the unbelievers do. We don't sorrow as those who have no hope beyond the grave, because we know that from the moment we confess faith in Jesus Christ, genuine faith in Jesus Christ, we have eternal life from that moment, and we've been promised that. In John three sixteen says. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but shall have eternal life. And eternal life, as we've said many times in the past, is not an endless quantity of life, but is a blessed quality of life in the presence of the living God. And in, 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 in Matthew uh, chapter 10, verse 39, Jesus, uh, Jesus uh, promised that in losing uh, your life, uh, you will find it, okay? And Christ assures his people that even death can't separate them from his love. In Romans chapter 8, verse 34 and 39, nothing can separate us from the love of God, not, not even death. And so we, we as Christians, uh, view death differently from uh, the nihilist or the, the natural man who thinks that he's going to return to a state of non-existence as he was in before birth.
Now, our, our lesson text ends here, but, but Paul goes on in the next couple of verses, uh, verse 22 of chapter 1, and says, But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor, yet what shall I choose? I wot not or know not. Verse 23, For I am in a strait betwixt two, or I'm d- divided between two choices. You're having a desire to depart and to be with Christ which is far better. And he goes on to say, but he's going, to, it's better for him to stay there so that he can continue to minister to them. And so, uh, Paul, uh, recognized that going to be with Christ was gain because he would be away from the, the suffering that he had to endure, uh, for his faith and his proclamation of the, of Jesus Christ. And he would be in, in joy and peace, uh, in the presence of the living God. And so just to summarize uh, our lesson here, we hope that uh, we've, we've gotten a little better understanding of, of, of uh, uh, a way to interpret our own uh, circumstances, again, good or bad. And in this context, bad, when we find ourselves in difficult circumstances, you know, um, we, we need to remember that, that God knows where we are. God has a purpose He's he's uh, created us for a purpose, and so when we when we uh, trust that God is fulfilling His purpose in us, and that means, of course, being surrendered to His will and being obedient to His word and will, uh, we can we can have great confidence uh, that God is accomplishing and will accomplish His His will through us, and and when we have that confidence, we can have this joy that Paul speaks about. Uh, this true joy that doesn't depend on our circumstances. And I, I've said this to people in the past. Uh, you know, there, there's nothing more satisfying in life than to be doing what you understand God created you to do when he wants you to do it, to be in obedience to him. There's nothing more satisfying in life than fulfilling the ultimate purpose for which you were created. And so we trust that you've gotten, again, a little better understanding of this passage. And we pray that you will, uh, you will be in church on Sunday. And may God bless you. And may God keep you. Amen.